going to be continuing a multi-part series and discussion that we began a long time ago before the season of Lent started about the nature and substance of God, which we finished part one of this multi-part series last Sunday when we looked at the seventh and final I Am statement Jesus makes about himself in the Gospel of John to discover who Jesus is by looking at his own words. Jesus, God the Son, God with us. And we did this and will continue to do this simply by asking, who is God? By looking into God's direct revelation to us about his, his nature, his substance, his character through his word for answers. Now, when you think about it, though, even with his word at our side, this is a huge question to be asking, but nevertheless a question that's needed to be asked. His word, once again, is our source in particular, because we discover through God's word that God reveals himself. God reveals himself through his word. He gives us a tidbit here and a tidbit there. And one of the questions God's been challenging me, especially through our daily readings that we've been doing and our reading plan, Seek Him, is what is he saying about himself? in the passages that we read. What is God teaching us about who he indeed is? One of the things we learn about God and his word, though, is he himself is one God in three persons. The word makes this clear that he, God, has revealed himself as one God in three persons, something we have come to know in the church today as the Holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Three in one. Not three gods, but one revealed to us in three personhoods. If you're a bit confused, don't feel bad. Because it is a bit confusing. In fact, as the age-old saying goes, God is the ocean, and we can but contain a drop. Just a drop. And praise be to God for allowing us to be able to contain just a drop. But there's so much vastly to still be discovered about who God is than just the drop. But boy, isn't the drop overwhelming in the most positive and best of ways. Thanks be to God for his word to help us to obtain just a drop of knowing him. For this drop causes our cups to overflow. With this being said, I have an image that has helped show me this very, very important part of understanding who God is. Because for me, it perfectly captures this most mysterious nature of God. It has helped me wrap my mind around this truth about God, and I hope it will help you as well. God the Father, God above us, God the Son, God with us, and God the Spirit, God in us. It is in this revelation of God as three in one where he shows us how we can truly relate, how we can connect, how we can be in relationship to him, the creator of all things, the one who speaks stars into existence, the one who says and it is done because we are created to be in relationship with him. We are connect, created to be in connection to him in the very beginning of time. When he makes us himself, he says, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. Which makes us ask, who is God talking to there? Some say he's speaking to the angelic host. Others say that the author of Genesis just messed up on the pronouns. However, most understand, and I fully believe and have stated this time and time again, like many others, that God is speaking to himself in his triune nature. For we see this triune nature in motion in the very beginning verses of the Bible. In the very beginning. You know what? Let's, let's look at this real quick, and let's read Genesis 1, 1 through 3 real quick. It says, In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. 
And God said, let there be light. And there was light. Now, you may be thinking after reading just these three verses, I don't see what you are saying, Pastor, to which I must reply, buckle up, because we're about ready to go on a wild ride. Not as wild as the rides that Phoebe makes me ride when we go to theme parks. Definitely not those. You're not going to lose your breakfast on this ride. But definitely a wild ride nonetheless. First, in the beginning, God. God is in the beginning. And as we understand, the Father is the orchestrator and master potter of all things, of all creation. If you could imagine with me, God the Father, in verse 1, raises his conductor's baton. As the Spirit is sent forth to the newly created lump of clay flying through the cosmos known as earth. And the first word, the first word in all of eternity is spoken by God. Let there be light. Who is it that speaks? Yes, it is God. But there is more here we must understand as Christians. As the Gospel of John, chapter 1, 1 through 5, makes clear, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There you have it. God the Son. Jesus Christ, the very word of God, he is in the beginning. And by him and through him, all things are made at the instruction of the Father, through the power of the Holy Spirit, by the spoken word of Jesus. Our God, three in one. God the Father, God above us, God the Son, God with us, God the Spirit, God in us. I started off today when we did our stream before our stream talking about a verse from Deuteronomy known as the Shema. It's Deuteronomy 6 4 and it says, Hear O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And there's a reason I, I wanted to talk about the Shema a little bit because I want to add a little emphasis to this for us today in our modern culture, in our modern society, in our modern church, because God has not changed one bit. So hear, O church, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Hear, O church, one God, three persons, our God is one. All God, all one, all revelations of God to us, which brings us to here and now. To where we're going to be beginning today as a family of families as we zoom in and focus on God the Spirit, God in us, as we'll be doing this all the way through the season of Easter as we rapidly approach the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit on God's people, on God's church in power to the early disciples, in the birth of his bride, his church. The very formation of our family of families, our history, our legacy. And I can't wait, for I believe God is doing a mighty work in the midst of the present troubles we face. And this work will be done through his church, through the empowerment of this very spirit we are going to begin discussing today. With this all being said, we'll be now turning to the Gospel of John. And we'll be looking at a section of the Gospel of John from the, four, or the, the 14th chapter, verses 16 through 31. And I want to encourage you right now, and I want to give you all a moment if you haven't already. I know Brother Frankie already invited you to go get your Bibles, but if you have a physical copy of the Bible, go get it. If you don't, let me know so I can get you one, but go get your Bibles. I don't know about you, but for me, there's something significant about reading from a Bible compared to reading from a document reader. And there's something special about opening God's word together. And so I want to give you all a chance to go and do just that. Now you may not have the ability to do that. Open it on your phone. But let's open the word together. Let's open the word together and see what it is God has to reveal to us today through his word. 
Now, before we dig in here, I'm going to provide some context to this moment in John. Because this moment in John is about halfway through a much larger moment that we find in John's Gospel. In particular, what we realize is that what we realize is that John is recording a large teaching of Jesus here. A teaching Jesus is having with his disciples. And this is just moments after Jesus just explained to his disciples that he was going to have to go away. But to not fear that he was going away because he was going to prepare a place for us in his heavenly kingdom, in his father's house. And so Jesus tells his disciples these things, and he also explains to them that he is the way, the truth, and the life. One of those I am statements, a powerful I am statement, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. And how we can know the Father if we truly would know him. And it's here where Jesus then begins discussing an amazing promise given to us by God. This promise being the sending and receiving of a Holy Spirit. The sending and receiving of His very Spirit. And this is where John 14, 16 through 31 starts up. It says, If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I want to read that one more time. I will not leave you as orphan, orphans. I will come to you. How beautiful is that? God has adopted us. God has brought us into his family as our father. He has taken us out of our old situation, our old life, and brought us into a new wonderful existence, a new and wonderful family. Verse 19 continues. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more. But you will see me, because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring, you to, bring to your remembrance all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced, because I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it takes place, so that when it does take place, you may believe. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming. He has no claim on me. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. This is the word of our Lord. There's so much 
so much that we can unpack here, but we have weeks to unpack it. For today's purpose, as an introduction to this next leg of our journey that we're taking as a family of families, I just want us to focus on a few key things from this passage. In particular, the first thing is understanding one of the most fundamental realities about the Holy Spirit when we speak about the nature and substance, the personhood of the Holy Spirit. And this fundamental reality is the Holy Spirit is a person, has a personhood. The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit has a way. The Holy Spirit is a who, not a what. Therefore, our question is who, not what. Who is the Holy Spirit? Who is God in us? First and foremost, we must understand the Holy Spirit is not an it. The Holy Spirit is not a what, but indeed is a who. The Bible, time and time again, throughout its entirety, helps us to understand the very nature of the Holy Spirit as truly being a personhood of God. He is a personal being. He is not an impersonal object. For starters, every time the Bible speaks about the Holy Spirit, personal pronouns are used. Like he. We don't see it. And as we are aware of English, and as we are aware that I don't know, I'm not an English scholar by any stretch of the imagination. Last I checked, you don't call objects by he or she. You use personal pronouns for people, not things. The Bible teaches us so much about this simple and wonderful fact. In particular, in Ephesians 4.30, we see a wonderful truth being spoken, and this is that the Holy Spirit can be grieved. Now, how is that a wonderful truth? In particular, it shows us the Holy Spirit feels. The Holy Spirit experiences. The Holy Spirit is very much alive and a person. Ephesians 4.30 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Isaiah 63.10 also says this, But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy, and himself fought against them. Can an object be grieved? Can an object feel emotions? Can an object be rebelled against, which is a fancy word of saying sinned against? No, an object cannot. It's an object. It has no understanding or being. However, a person, a, an actual being with a will and a way, most definitely can. The Bible then teaches us more about the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit can be lied to. In Acts 5.3, we see Luke writing this, But Peter said to Ananias, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? Can an object be lied to? No! For a lie to be a lie, that which is being lied to must be able to understand it has been lied to. It is kind of like when I dropped my teddy bear as a child by accident from the top bunk of my bed. I would rush down off my bunk and I'd grab it and I'd hold it and I'd rock it. And I'd be like, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'd never do it again, I'll never do it again. Only to find out that it would happen again and I'd feel so bad because I had lied to a stuffed animal that had no being, that had no understanding. It couldn't be lied to because it didn't know it had been lied to. Now that's enough embarrassing stories from Pastor Brandon's past. I digress. If the Holy Spirit can be lied to, the Holy Spirit therefore must understand he has been lied to. Therefore, not an impersonal object, but a personal being. And we are just starting here. We're called to obey the Holy Spirit 
Acts 10, 19-21 says, And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? The Holy Spirit has a will. The Holy Spirit has a way. And the Holy Spirit directs us in his will, in his way. Because the Holy Spirit is God. Therefore, we have no other choice with the Holy Spirit being God in us than to obey when the Holy Spirit shows us his will and his way. Obeying objects can lead us into very sticky situations. Could you imagine if we were required to fully obey an object? I know, for example, I have this thing. It's called a smartphone. But honestly, even though it has the name smartphone, sometimes I find it's not very smart. Especially when it autocorrects some of my text messages that it sends to people before I get a chance to review the correction. And I'm like, oh, wow, that isn't what I wanted to say at all. I'm sure many of you have been in those shoes too as well. It's like, oh, I didn't want to say that. Yeah, smartphones sometimes can be not so smart. And the point is, imagine if we had to obey an object that has no will, that has no way. We can get ourselves in some pretty nasty messes. Just like how GPS has always tried to autocorrect the directions to and from places and tries to tell us, no, you're gonna take this route. I have a short One author once put it this way when discussing the personhood of the Holy Spirit to help us expand this understanding of who, not what, even further by saying, the priest the personhood of the Holy Spirit is also affirmed by his many works. He was personally involved in creation, Genesis 1-2. He empowers God's people, Zechariah 4-6. He guides in Romans 8-14. He comforts John 14-26. He convicts John 16-8. He teaches John 16-13. He restrains sin, Isaiah 59-19. And he gives commands, Acts 8-29. Each of these works requires the involvement of a person rather than a mere force, a thing, or an idea. And if you would like a list of those scripture references, I'll be more than happy to send them to you. Just let me know. But isn't this the truth? Finally, to help us fully understand not what, but who, we need to understand, as we talked about, when we first began diving into God's Word today, the Holy Spirit is affirmed by the Word of God as being God and possessing the same attributes and qualities and characteristics of God. The Holy Spirit is shown to us to be all-knowing. The Holy Spirit is shown to be all-present. The Holy Spirit is shown to be eternal because the Holy Spirit is God. The Holy Spirit is God. This is just a scratch into the surface of the full truth of this wonderful reality. But it's enough of a scratch. It is enough of a drop of the ocean of God to help us understand what the Holy Spirit is and what, it is, what the Holy Spirit is not. And that is a mere object. Rather, it's the very Spirit of God who resides in us, with us. As Jesus explains in John 14, 16, through 17 very clearly to us these two verses of our reading explains clearly to us this and I will ask the father and he will give you another helper to be with you forever even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you bringing us to another key thing that we must unpack today from our passage from John that we read and it is found right here contained in these two verses and it is a wonderful truth that we do not want to miss and it has something to do with a wonderful truth that we've already spoken of when we began this time in the word together today 
This is found in verse 16. When Jesus says he's going to send another helper. First and foremost, we need to look at how helper is written in your Bible in verse 16. Do you notice anything unusual about how this is written? When we compare this word helper to other places, like when God makes Eve to be a helper for Adam in Genesis, there's a big difference between helper here and helper there. Can you see what is unique in this word? Comment below if you do. I know that we're on like a 10 to 20 second delay, so I'm going to pause for a moment and take a sip of coffee and a deep breath while I wait for your awesome answers. Our awesome tech lady, my mother, she made me say that, um, who is following the comment feed will tell me who answers and what they say. For those watching on your TV and you can't comment below, just yell wildly at your TV. That will be acceptable too right now. I was just informed there was a technical difficulty. I'm sorry about that. Any responses? I assure you, if you're afraid of getting embarrassed by getting the wrong answer, that is okay. Because in this case, there are definitely wrong answers. <laughs> oh well, we'll just continue then. Helper is capitalized. The H in helper is capitalized here. Why is that? Here is why. Helper here is considered a proper noun because helper here is considered to be an address and a naming of God. This other helper Jesus is talking about is God. Now we need to understand something very important about Jesus' words here. When he says another helper, this is not another God as in a different God. This is sadly one of those many cases in English where the language just fails to truly capture the full significance of what it originally meant in Greek. One commentator wrote about this and said, two different Greek words can be translated another, alas and hetros. Alas used here means another of the same kind, while hetros means another of a different kind. Is there a way that we can illustrate this? Sure. Right here, I have the most juicy the most fantastic, the best orange ever. And I'm gonna take some time today to use my Star Trek transporter, if I had such a thing, and send one to you and your family. And everybody on our live stream is getting the most juiciest, best orange ever. Well, let's say I started doing that and I ran out of the most juiciest and the best orange ever. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, everyone else that hasn't received the orange yet. You're going to get another kind of juicy fruit. You're going to get a tomato or tomato, whatever your preference is. The point here is Petros. It's another fruit, but it's a completely different kind of fruit. There is nothing comparative between these two things other than they're a fruit. To give another helper, as Jesus would say, would be if I would if I actually had a Star Trek transporter, I would also have a replicator, because those things are awesome. They can make whatever you want. And I could just keep making as many of these juicy best oranges as I would ever want. And I'd be able to send them to everybody. But the point is, I don't have any of that. And I only have one of these. And I have one of these. So someone's gonna end up with this, the tomato over the best, juiciest orange ever. Not that tomatoes are bad, not that there's nothing wrong with tomatoes, it's completely different. It's not the same. The word Jesus used, as this commentator says, describing the helper who was to come was alas, which means another helper just like him. Jesus was confronting his disciples by assuring them they did not need to be troubled at his leaving 
because the helper or counselor he would send was just like him. There would be no loss in the exchange. So much are they the same that in Romans 8, 9, the Apostle Paul calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ. Have you ever wished you could speak with Jesus face to face? This author asked. So you could share your deepest concerns and fears and in his physical presence and see his face as you list, as he listened and see his understanding and loving feedback. You might tell him, Master, I thought I would have my life all together by now, but I have never felt more disoriented and confused. What's the answer? Or perhaps, I feel worthless. I do my best, but you always come up short. Lord, what's wrong? After I just keep coming up short. What's wrong with me? After our personal interview of Jesus, we would without a doubt find our self-worth substantially changed, substantially grown, our security established, our emptiness satisfied. That talk with Jesus would give us great comfort and strength for our lives. The logic of our text here is that having the helper the Holy Spirit is the same as having Jesus with us presently. In fact, Jesus says in the, our passage that this would be better. It's better that he would leave so that he could send the helper, so that he could send the Holy Spirit. Imagine if Jesus were in Jerusalem right now. Could you imagine the mass migration we would see in the world? Airlines would be trying to move all their planes to the Middle East. and Everybody would be trying to go there. Every boat, every train would be going there. If you're playing a game of Ticket to Ride, your routes would all point to Jerusalem because that's where Jesus was. That is where Jesus was, and everybody would want to get there. And sure, you might be one of the lucky ones to actually get a ticket to get to go see Jesus. But when you got there, there would be thousands of people. You may not even be able to get close. You may not even be able to get close enough to reach out and even say, Hey, Jesus! Because everyone would be there. It would be nearly impossible to get close to reach him. This is why the Holy Spirit is better. And Jesus himself says this in John 16, 7. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. We have access to the Holy Spirit right here, right now. Or better yet, with our stay-at-home order, you have access to the Holy Spirit right where you are, right now. You have access to Jesus right where you are, right now, always. He is with each and every one of us by our sides, dwelling within us. Even better, he is, isn't just hanging around, but he has a purpose as our counselor, our helper, our comforter. And isn't this a wonderful thing? You don't need to board a plane, pay expensive travel fees, or even drive down the street to a big building to be of God. You are in the very presence of God already through the empowerment of his Holy Spirit. Bringing us to a point of pause to pray and to meditate on what the word has taught us today. As there are so many other things we could discuss in relation to the Holy Spirit of God, but we will save those for future days as we continue to discover who God is one step of a time through his word together as a family of families. Therefore, today, remember, the question is not what. The question is who when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal object. Rather, the Holy Spirit is the personhood, the very personhood of God. The Holy Spirit is the fullness of God who resides in us and therefore is God in us. Join us next week when we learn more about the nature, the substance, and the personhood of the Holy Spirit as we will discuss the work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian's life. The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord remains forever.
Amen and amen.